Whichever path contains mature themes, adult language, and situations that some may find unsettling, listener discretion is advised. Over 48 hours have passed since your child was taken. Agent Temple had been your lifeline when Holt attempted to frame you. He asked for you to trust him, to find your kid. And though every part of you howled to get out there and find Cole yourself, you agreed. And so you waited. But what did you get for it? Your neighbors went on social media trying to gather support for the cops that ransacked your home. Most of your weapons are confiscated. And Holt was released on bond, awaiting trial from the comfort of his own home. And what about Cole? Temple's team had found little. Sharing photographs of your basement, the Merrimack River, and what appears to be one of Cole's shoes. The constant thread that ran through all of these photos were mushrooms. Mushrooms growing in your basement, by Cole's recovered shoe, by the riverbed. Finally, you were allowed back into your home. You inspected the basement. The spot where Myron Fells was killed and possibly devoured by fungus and where the scarred intruder had promised that they would lead you to your boy. You assembled the hidden AK-47 you had stowed in the empty oil tank in your basement. And over by the bulkhead, you found some more mushrooms and a note, scrawled in Sharpie from the one person who may be able to lead you to your son. With Jamie by your side, you had a final choice to make. Stay home and wait for word from Temple, or do something rash. You voted. And now, whichever path presents Sentry's finale, eat, see, follow. You want to do what? I'm not saying I want to eat mushrooms, but... The, just put the gun down on the ground and say that again. You put the gun down, leaning it against the washing machine. Your mouth is dry. Jamie's looking at you with confusion and fear. You swore vows to stick by your wife, to be her partner in everything, but you also swore to protect her and Cole. But if the only way to do it is to lie, well, you know what you have to do, don't you? I sound crazy, and I look even worse holding a rifle in the middle of the basement. I'm sorry, baby. I moved us up here. I didn't want to, but I did. This is all my fault. We backed the feds, and it's been days without any progress. If we leave it to just them, Cole... Cole might not come home. I'm going to call Mom to come up here and help us out. I'm also going to call some of the guys and ask them to fly out and help if I can. Uh, I can't go it alone. Oh, God. Paving. Good. Let's do this. Let's call her right now. She'll be so happy to come up. We'll get everyone we can together and we'll get out there and find our baby. You're right. Take that gun upstairs and put it where you want it to be. I'll call mom. You kiss each other and Jamie takes the gun upstairs as you call your mother. You speak calmly and fill her in as you walk toward the bulkhead. The sound of Jamie's footsteps place her in the hallway leading upstairs. She's going to put the gun in your closet. That will take a couple of minutes. With little time to spare, you grab a fistful of the mushrooms. <laughs> your mother is crying on the phone, and you don't have the energy to console her. You tell her someone is at the door. She tells you that she loves you, and you reciprocate. You pop two of the mushroom caps in your mouth. They taste like shit, but you finish swallowing them before you go upstairs. You turn on the sink and look at the fistful of mushrooms you're holding. You feel Jamie walk into the kitchen as you toss the rest of the mushrooms into the sink and shove them into the drain before turning on your disposal. 
as they're ground into mush. Jamie looks relieved. I'm proud of you. I'm just gonna follow the plan. Let's go to bed. You shove the front door closed and seal it shut with Gorilla Tape. As you ascend the stairs, each step gives a pleasant creak. It's a sound you barely notice most days, but it's like a reassuring purr to your ears. Fuck. It's the mushrooms kicking in. The cops tore up the hallway, but Cole's room was barely touched. You find Jamie sitting on his bed. She's holding the ratty, stuffed bunny that Mom gave Cole for his third birthday. Jamie's stroking its matted fur. We never got him the chickens your mom promised. Placing a hand on your wife's back, you feel her heart beating, softly. Your own heartbeat feels like it's on a different rhythm. You're worried she might notice, so you say something. When he gets home, we'll get a coop and chickens. Fuck. I'll get a big, loud-ass rooster. Give the neighbors another reason to hate me. We should go to bed. Right? You don't usually sleep when you're upset. Nothing about this as usual, baby. Let's sleep. Jamie is out the moment you're in bed. It's been that way ever since you met her. You'd be the one getting up, warming up milk, and sitting with Cole while she took her needed rest. Most nights, you lie awake in bed for hours. You wonder what she sees in you. Her current extensions don't need a bonnet. You miss it. The bonnet made her look like the big bad wolf, the one who ate Red Riding Hood's grandma. You told her that once, and she didn't laugh. The moon is full and high in the sky, just outside of your window. Jamie lets out a low growl in her sleep. She's not a wolf, you have to tell yourself. Your camera app lets you know something is moving outside. Do you open the app to see what it is? It's the hammock, swaying back and forth. Nothing inside it, just like before. And that's a comfort until you see the long, thin fingers creep out from its folds and grab onto the edge. A head emerges abruptly from the hammock, its eyes reflecting the night vision glow from the camera. Then they turn black the bald head of the monster beginning to grow jet black hair. And there, on the screen, is your comic character, Lyle. He waves at the camera. You slide out of bed, finding your jeans where you dropped them. You put them on, grab your jacket off its hook on the back of the closet door. Opening it slowly, you peer inside. Your god isn't there. Where did she hide it? Should you ask her? No. You're trying to sneak out. You look back at the app. Lyle is just lounging in the hammock, smoking a cigarette and staring up at the sky. Before leaving your bedroom, you look out of your window, down into the yard. And there Lyle is. He is exactly as you drew him. Paper white skin, jet black hair and eyes. His flannel shirt is the same black and white as they are in your drawings. Creeping down the stairs, you stop in the garage and find the machete you use for gardening. You strap the sheath onto your belt. The night air is cold. You can see your breath. Lyle continues to rock in your hammock. Well, man, it took you long enough, didn't it? You know where we have to go. Lyle is in the hammock one second and the next is standing in front of you gesturing to the gate in the fence that leads into the woods. Between one blink and the next, his head is cocked to the side. It's like all of his movements are happening wherever you aren't looking at him. Just follow me, my man. I'll get you to where we gotta go. Man, why'd you even come back to this shit-ass town anyway? Like a damn burn victim asking a bum of smoke outside the hospital. Damn. Let's go before Jamie sees I'm gone. He's always ten feet ahead of you in the woods, appearing just behind a tree or bush, pointing the way. You're careful with your steps. The moonlight seeps through the canopy. 
Whenever you reach where you last saw Lyle, you find a small cluster of mushrooms. You hear the rustle of bushes and the scurrying of small game all around you. Lyle is waiting for you by the hill that leads to the tracks. Cigarette in his mouth, a trail of smoke reaching to the heavens and blending with the clouds covering the moon. He points to where the scarred intruder disappeared all those weeks ago. His black eyes are like dark mirrors, and you catch your own unsure reflection in them. Man, why are you looking at me like that? <laughs> I ain't gonna kiss you. You ain't my Taco Bell manager. Get moving. You turn toward the railroad tracks, only to see Lyle six yards away, standing amidst the poison oak on the other side of the tracks. The gravel under your feet crunches as you cross. You don't want to walk through the poison oak, so you step around it. Lyle is waiting underneath an old pine. You recognize it. It's the last big tree before the rope swing that you and your friends put up by the river 24 years ago. You amble up the hill, sliding on pine needles a bit. When you reach the top, you see the old rope swing, hanging from a strong branch over the cliff. On the riverbank, a small green rowboat sits on the shore. Lyle is in it, looking up at you. Using the rope swing to rappel down the cliff, you think about Cole's shoe. You hear Lyle spit when you push the boat into the river. The current is quick, but manageable with the oar. There's another one in the boat. Lyle, you gonna help? Lyle isn't behind you in the boat. With the moon reflecting on the water, you're alone, drifting south toward Manchester. You're high on mushrooms, alone, in the middle of a fast-moving river at night. You keep the boat steady. Panicking now isn't going to help. It's then when you realize that the boat has oar locks. Stupid. You slide the oars into place and use them to move the little rowboat closer to the shore. You see Lyle, standing on a rock just downstream. He's holding his thumb out like a hitchhiker. He doesn't cast a reflection on the water. You pass him and see the ruins of an old mill on the riverbank. It's where Roe had attempted, and failed, to get in on the textile business that was booming in nearby Manchester. From what your father had told you when you were young, the mill was doing well in its first two years, until it mysteriously caught fire, killing the workers inside. The land wasn't used again. You and your friends only explored it once or twice. Most people didn't go out there often, on account of half the roof caving in. But standing on the shore, next to its old sewer runoff, was Lyle. Though overgrown, you could see the stone gutter under his feet, the drainage pipe behind him. You guide the boat over and listen to its gentle scrape over the rocks. Pulling it all the way onto shore, you look into the drainage pipe. It's massive. You could walk down it easily without bumping your head. Lyle is standing just inside, his white skin standing out in the shadows. There's something burning up the hill. You can smell the smoke. You can see the dull orange of a small fire through one of the broken windows of the mill. It could be a few homeless people camping out, but you know it's not. That can wait. Time to go into the warren, little rabbit. What is it? Get a move on, man. Clock is ticking. I didn't bring a light. Well, follow me, Theseus. I'll get you through that maze. The drainage pipe is mostly dry. The smell of mold is faint. You maneuver around an old, rusted shopping cart that somebody must have dragged in here years ago. The further you go in, the darker it gets. You move forward slowly, sliding your feet forward to feel for anything you may trip on. The side of the drainage pipe is cold on your left hand. You're groping in the darkness for a good 50 feet. In the pitch black, your mind projects your old home day altercation. 
seeing Cole get off a bus with his black eye, Holt kicking you. And then you think of Myron. He's standing next to you, silent, and very dead. I'm so sorry for what happened to you, man. He touches your hand and puts a piece of paper into it. I can't read this in the dark. He's gone. You come to a sharp right turn. You're getting close to being under the mill. At first, you think you're imagining it, but there are bright green splotches on the floor of the pipe. Your eyes adjust. They're the gills of mushrooms. Glow-in-the-dark mushrooms. Not bright enough to see anything at eye level, but they flank your path, leading you into the black toward the wall. You feel the brick, which is solid, even though the masonry is old. You feel breath on your back, and smell nicotine. Crouch on down. This way to the boy. You get on all fours, feeling a slight breeze ahead of you. There's a hole in the bricks. Feeling its edges, it'll be a squeeze, but you can manage it. You grimace as you crawl through the tight space, the old bricks scraping at you through your jacket. The smell of wet earth is all around you. Now you are in complete blackness. You stand up slowly. All right, Lyle. Now what? Now? Well, I thought it was simple. You will help us as we have asked you to. The walls around you begin to glow as phosphorescent mushrooms bloom all over the walls. The light they're giving off is enough for you to see Lyle standing in front of you. His face is flaking off onto his shirt. You reach out and touch his cheek, and the skin cracks and falls away. Underneath is the face of the scarred intruder. What the fuck? I asked you to come here for Cole and for us. You didn't come fast enough, and danger is here. What? Cole? Cole! The scarred creature pulls away from you, and you hear a loud crack. The shirt and back of its body split open, and the creature slides itself out of this hole. The empty shell stands in place in front of you for a moment and then falls apart under its own weight. The monster reaches out a hand to you. You reach for your machete. The creature sighs and then gestures for you to follow. They bring you toward another wall that appears to be covered with some sort of lichen. The lichen parts like a curtain, allowing them to pass through with ease. You follow and you find yourself in a dimly lit basement hallway. Where the fuck are we? This is a place for those who can't hide who they are. It was made with the help of an old family. Labrie Mill was to be a place for the ones who lived below and apart to craft and make what they needed to live as best they could. You follow them down the hall. Passing an open door, you look up into the shadows. There's a woman in there. She appears afraid. She's naked from the waist up, covered in tattoos. You take some time to study them and notice her neck. The locust. Hey, I know you. Kaylee! Did you bring my son here? She opens her mouth and you hear the sound of buzzing. She retreats into the black corners of her room. You're about to go in after her before a swarm of locusts bursts from the doorway and rushes past you. You swat at them, but the scarred creature puts his hand on your forearm. The swarm flies off down the hallway. Do not hurt them. They did what they did to make sure that you would come. And to save your son from something very... Very foul. What the hell are you? A lost people. Not dissimilar from your son. 
or even Dina, but very, very different. Both are here, though Dina has long decided to stay with Kaylee and us. How many of you are there? Too few. The way to us is hard to find these days. Ever since the monster began to roam the ruins above. Monster? Have you seen you? <laughs> Have you seen you? You are still sore and weak from the beating. The monster is the same one that was waiting for Cole. For Dina. The same one that took Myron Fells. That cracked open Kaylee Rourke's cocoon and led her to her truest self. He knew the real story of the mill's burning. He knew that the people of Roe wished to burn out Labrie's grotesques. And he fills the ruins above with trophies of his conquests. He sees himself as a demon among you. He is right. But you have done something to him. And now he is burning. Burning all the evidence. And I fear the fires. That they will lead him down here. To us. Enough of your bullshit. Bring me to Cole. It wouldn't help Cole or you if you were reunited just yet. For the beast waits for us all. Slay the beast or he will find us. The sound of the machete coming out of its sheath rings in your ears. You point it at the scarred creature's face. It regards your blade carefully before touching the tip with its fingers. <sighs> A dark patch of mold begins to spread down the blade. None of this is making any sense. You hear the buzzing of the insects, whispers from the dark corners of the basement through the open doorways and shadows. You don't know if any of this is real. Slay the beast and save us all. Okay. Take me to your monster. You walk past more denizens of the underground. There's a cyclops, his beard long and thick, holding onto the hand of a woman with a cat's head. They nod at you and let you pass. A mist envelops you and the scarred creature, and as you inhale, you see visions of a woman who, while running from some men in the dead of night, is cornered by the river. As they get closer to her, she looks at the fog rolling across the top of the current and begs to change places. And her wish is granted. You rush forward, coughing, and stub your toe on the first metal step of a spiral staircase that leads upward. The beast waits above. You ascend the stairs carefully. They are barely supporting your weight. You make your way to the top where there is a locked hatch. You slide the bolt and push up on the hatch door with all of your strength. Your broken rib sends blossoms of pain all over your vision as the hatch opens up with a screech. Rubble falls from the ceiling above, landing about seven feet away from the hatch onto the stone floor. You can smell the smoke of a nearby fire. The night sky is visible through the collapsed roof above you. You've made too much noise, and you know it. But still, you slowly creep out of the hole and into the shadows. You can hear faint footsteps coming from just outside the building. Machete at the ready. You put your back to the wall and inch yourself over to the broken windows. Their pain's long gone and look out. Holt is advancing on the building his pistol in his hand. He's got a fire going in an oil drum. You grab up a loose brick and toss it across the room, through a doorway. It lands on something metal. Holt nearly jumps and then bolts toward the noise. NH State Police, come out of the building. 
Now. You slide through a crack in the wall into another room. You can see another doorway leading outside. There's cover in here, but you don't know the terrain. Holt's footsteps are in the room you just left. What's this? Attention! You are trespassing on state property! Come out of the basement now and we'll talk about this. All right. Have it your way. You hear Holt starting down the stairs. Cole is down there, somewhere. If the creature that led you here is to be believed. You sneak over to the crack to get a look. You can see the hatch, but you can't see Holt. How did he get down there so quickly? The bullet grazes the top of your skull before you realize you are not the only one trained in misdirection. Falling to the ground, you try to get up before he gets to you. Well, I didn't expect to see you so soon. I thought I'd have to go through some stupid trial. See you making some big outburst when I beat all the charges. Is that why you're out here? Trying to catch me before I burn my trophies? You try to respond, but you throw up from the pain. Holt laughs. laughs. I had considered killing myself here. Just in case I couldn't burn the evidence, but... Now you're here, and... Well, new plan. How about you get up? Take a swing with your little knife there. And I get to kill the killer, after all. You aren't... going to get away. Maybe not. But you definitely won't. How'd you open that hatch? I've tried for years, but it was locked from the... Wait. Is that how you knew it was me? Are you why I couldn't find that other boy and your son? Did you do him before I did? Fuck, man. Are you like me? I knew it. I knew there was something in you. That's how you got rid of Fells so quick. It was right there under my nose. The phone, the missing kids. I thought somebody else was trying to lead you to me, but... But that wasn't it. You wanted me to see you. I'm so sorry, man. I wish I had seen you. You roll onto your back and wipe the blood from your face. He's standing over you. He steps onto the blade of your machete before you can grab the handle. This was all a game, huh? You had me going. It's just too bad it had to end this way. We'd have been a good team for a while, but in the end... The public needs a monster to pin all this horror on. No reason they should get two. Hey, before you go, I wanted to know... How did killing your own kid feel? My son isn't dead. No? Well, great. That gives me something to look forward to after I'm done here. Good night, friend. The board breaks across the back of Holt's skull and he falls on top of you. You bite into his neck, and when he attempts to hit you in the skull with the butt of his pistol, you're able to grab his wrist and wrestle the gun away. The two of you are rolling on the ground, kicking and screaming. You wind up on top of him and slam his head into the stone floor of the ruin, until his hand stops clawing at your body, and a wet gurgle erupts from his bloody lips. You stand and nearly lose your balance. You stumble toward your machete, raising it over your head, ready to bring it down on Holt's skull. But as you're about to swing, you look and see Cole, holding a broken board in his hands, staring at you. Dad? You drop the machete. <laughs> Cole? Dad, are you okay? Having your son in your arms, you sob openly. You repeat his name with every breath. The mushrooms are wearing off. You can feel the chill of the air, the wetness of your blood. The pain is beginning to be unbearable. As your eyes lose focus, you start worrying you are about to die. No. No. No, not now. Cole, help me to find his phone. 
We gotta reach your mom. Dad, are you alright? Ah, oh, I found you. Why wouldn't I be? Agent Temple arrives with more agents, a dozen cops, and three ambulances. You are lifted onto a stretcher and seen to. Jamie arrives and almost gets in with you, before you both notice that Cole is being checked on by EMTs six yards away. You tell her to go to him, and she does. As they load you into the ambulance, you can see the hatch you came out of. It's closed. Nearby, people are taking pictures of Holt. Before the ambulance doors are closed, someone puts a sheet over that asshole's face. And honestly, it's the second happiest moment you've had since this mess began. You're in the hospital for two weeks. The news is reporting about the hero cop turned serial killer. Temple visits you in the hospital. Your son is probably the bravest kid I've ever met. He's like his mom. I just wish you would let me know that you were going after Holt. Holt came to the yard to taunt me. I followed. I didn't know if he still had coal. And, uh, I'd be dead if you all hadn't showed up. You gonna arrest me for saving my son? No, no, no. DA is already saying no charges are coming. The local media has decided you're a hero now. I just need to piece together certain things I don't understand about how you ended up out there. I followed the white rabbit. Jamie wanted to be mad at you, but you got Cole home. She comes to the hospital whenever she can. Your mom watches Cole, while your cousin and your brothers from the Corps have been repairing your house and keeping watch overnight, mainly to keep your neighbors uneasy and significantly shamed. Cole doesn't talk to you about what happened to him while he was gone. You convince Jamie to stop asking him. He'll tell you when he's ready. When you come home, you see a bunch of flowers and balloons on your lawn. You're told they're from the neighbors, and it's satisfying to walk all over them. Over the next few weeks, you find a realtor and put that fucking house up for market. It sells for far more than you asked for it within two weeks. Jamie wants to move back south, and you just want to get the fuck away from here. One night, while boxing up all the shit you have in the backyard, you catch the scent of mold and rot on the wind. You couldn't see them, but you knew they were standing just beyond your fence. You did not expose us, even though you could have. Thank you. <sighs> you kept my son safe, so I'm going to keep your secret. But don't think I don't know why you fucking did it. You wanted me to kill Holt for you. You knew he'd eventually bring attention to your home. You could have saved us all a lot of pain if you had just fucking done it yourself. But I couldn't have killed him. I couldn't. Why? I've never killed anyone. I am not that kind of monster. <laughs> you put down your box and walk over to the fence. You place one hand roughly at the height you know that their head would be, and unsnap your holster. Before you realize... just how right they are. You snap it shut again and walk inside with your box. Setting it down on the table, you reach into your pocket for an oxy you were told to take before the pain kicked in. You find a crumpled piece of paper. You smooth it out and read the note. Then you tear it up and throw out the pieces before anyone else can read it.
And just like that, this is how Sentry ends. The choices you made neared calamity, but in the end, you found your son. Through it all, you and the rest of our listeners kept the faith and participated in votes actively. Three of the decisions being near ties. You were played by Tyler Bell. Journey LaFon played Jamie. Mars LaFon played Cole. Harlan Guthrie played Trooper Holt. Mike Gagney played Agent Temple. Stephen LaFon played the Scarred Intruder. Century's finale was written by Stephen and Journey, produced by Whichever Path. The Whichever Path theme was by Ryder. Foley by Whichever Path and Audio Hero. The following music appears courtesy of EpidemicSound.com. The Stakeout by Christopher Mo Ditlifson. Chip on Your Shoulder and Spider Room by Ethan Sloan. Superluminal Motion by Prosody. Underwater Disturbance by Kabi Costa. Eye for Detail by Jay Varden. The Vanished by John Barzetti. Bitter Heart by Mamie. And before you go, know that none of this is possible without you. Our Patreon subscribers are helping us pay for our software, equipment, actors, and the art that makes this a richer show. And right now, patrons are beginning another interactive tale that is exclusive only to paid members. We're excited to be bringing that to them. For only $5 a month, you can get access to all of the exclusive episodes we've done from the beginning. $10 gets you behind the scenes content, and our higher tiers bring you even more exclusives. Go to patreon.com slash whichever path and help us chart the future. We're going to be taking a mid-season break after Sentry for about five weeks. And in the interim, if you love this story, rate it highly wherever you listen to podcasts. Turn more people onto the path as we produce what's coming next. Don't go away just yet, because we want you to hear an excerpt from Tyler Bell's latest West Side fairy tale story, Sin Carriers. If you loved him as you, subscribe to his hit show and consider being a Patreon of his work as well. He's probably one of our favorite people, and we're so glad to have worked with him on this story for almost an entire year. That's it for us for a little while. Until we see you again, sleep with a clear consequence. Choose the path. Elias pushed himself tighter against the alley wall, feeling the broken brick wetness cooling his cheek and soaking into his torn suit jacket. His left hand crept up to his heart, which beat so loud in his ears he could barely hear the din of the bar around the corner, much less the sounds he was actually straining to hear. Horses' hooves. The whip of wind through a long jacket. Possibly, there was nothing to be worried about. Possibly... He'd just seen the movement of a curtain, heard the inconstant prancing of a wounded horse. Possibly, he'd had too many drinks waiting for the blasted ship to finally arrive in port, and he was just sprinting around the wharf for no reason, scaring whores with his frenzied, darting eyes and making men suspicious, making an ass of himself. Then he heard it, the noise, the worst one he could hear. The whistling. The goddamn whistling. The hoofs came next, a horse at a saunter, moving down the shining midnight cobbles toward the alley he'd ducked into. Its steps were only slightly offbeat, the hoof with the broken ankle stamping just out of time. He dared a glance out into the alley and their eyes met, him and the rider, and he broke into a run. Elias bolted across the street, risking exposure to avoid getting caught against the cliffs behind him. The wounded horse whinnied, and he felt something pass behind him to skitter down the street. He rounded the corner at the back of the buildings and tripped into a half-rotted wooden railing and went through the thing. For a moment he was falling, and then he was rolling over blunt hunks of rock and grass, not knowing whether he should try to stop himself. He finally came to rest in a trickling gutter, 
surprising himself with how quickly he managed to jump to his feet and continue on, not daring a look back and screaming when he heard another whistle and then the loud thunk of something burying itself in a wooden door beside his head. If he paused at all, it was only long enough to touch the heavy red envelope in his jacket pocket. The next alley led him into a deep crowd of drunken Catholics, singing and raising fat glasses of beer over their heads. Only a handful seemed to notice him or even seemed shocked or concerned about how shabby he was. They merely stepped out of his way and continued talking and singing their inane songs. When he looked back over his shoulder, he could see the rider, the shape of him at least, sitting tall atop his horse in the alley. God damn it, Elias whispered under his breath, watching the figure stride out of sight. He tried to keep track of where the thing was going, but he couldn't make heads or tails of the shadows through the carousing mass. These were the German sort of Catholics, obnoxiously tall people, many of them done up in costumes and even wearing absurd headpieces. He pushed his way through them, trying to find a good middle ground between the edge of the crowd and the alleys the rider had disappeared into. His only option was to get to the pier. That was evident enough. They'd learned the thing had enough troubles with rivers and lakes that the ocean herself should prove more than enough to get it off Elias' trail for good. That had been the plan when he got here. That and making the handoff at the mermaid right after her arrival. But the goddamned mermaid hadn't arrived, and the rider had caught up with him. Now he could either count the money as lost and run, or stay and die. Kellen had gotten greedy and stayed back in Utah. And look how that had turned out. Elias found himself short of breath and stumbled. Somebody had spilled something warm on him, one of those goddamn Germans. He touched the wet spot on his back and returned a hand and forearm shining red with blood. That's not right, he thought to himself. Curious German faces looked down at him. One of them asked if he was okay, and he slapped at the man, a gesture so weak it was interpreted as asking for help to his feet. A crowd had gathered around Elias, and they were now speaking in rough and worried voices to each other. They started carrying him in the direction of the buildings he'd run from, toward the rider. No! He yelled, twisting wildly. Something gave in his back, and he screamed all the louder. The Germans began screaming too, clearly trying to get him to stop moving. None of them seemed to see the rider there in the shadows between the buildings the eyeless flap of skin over its face catching an errant breeze as it adjusted itself on its saddle. Elias realized he was looking at Kellen's face. Get, get the fuck off me, he screamed, finally fumbling his way out of the German's hands. They shouted amongst each other and pointed at him, pleaded with him to calm down. He pulled out his pistol and fired into the air. The report was pathetic, a little crack but it made the Germans duck down and back away from him. He tried to holster the thing, but dropped it. The Germans screamed, expecting it to go off, but it merely lay there in the quickening rain. He bent and scraped it off the ground, stumbling and dropping to his knees as he did so. Get the... Get the fuck away from me, he said, looking through the crowd to the thing watching him from atop its horse. He pushed himself to his feet, leaving a scarlet cloud in the water on the pavement. Then he holstered the gun, rose, and limped away. What could go wrong in a month? 31 days, 744 hours. Less than that if you have a decent sleep schedule, but I've yet to meet anyone who does, so I'm going to assume you all to be insomniacs or solar-powered robots until proven otherwise. Does anyone actually leave their house before 8pm anymore? I'm not leaving beforehand to check, so that can remain a mystery for now. 
I'd argue 8 p.m. is a world-known time to collect energy drinks and any source of caffeine before settling down and pretending to do those papers due last month. But that's beside the point. Talking to the cat doesn't count as therapy, you know. No, but he's a good listener. I don't blame you. It's been a long month. You ready to put an end to it, Micah? As ready as I'll ever be. Then lead the way, Nick's bad luck. We've got a curse to stop. What's the worst that could happen? Famous last words, Salem. Famous last words. Hurry up, guys, or I'm leaving without you. Time's up. Let's go before Bailey starts messing with things he shouldn't. What could go wrong in a month? Spoiler alert, the answer's a lot. Like, a lot, a lot. Stream Mixed Bad Luck wherever you listen to podcasts, and join us on our journey to find the good luck amongst the bad.